Hello and welcome to HelpYourMath.com. In this video, we're going to look at quadratic functions and the forms that they come in. Before we get started on what a quadratic function is, we need to understand that a quadratic function is a type of polynomial function. And a polynomial function has a really scary looking uh, description. So we say that a polynomial function, which usually we call p of x, is equal to a sub n times x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a sub 0. Pretty terrifying, right? Oh, and there's one more restriction. Um, n is an integer. In fact, it's not just an integer, it's a positive integer. Okay, so n is a positive integer. So basically a polynomial function, if there's a variable present, then it has a positive integer exponent. So if we see x squared or x to the eighth, x to the 24th, all fine. If we see x to the 1 half, no good. x to the negative 3, no, no good. So that's what a polynomial function is, and quadratic functions are just a special type of polynomial function. Moving on, what are quadratic functions? Quadratic functions are uh, polynomial functions in which the largest exponent of any uh, variable, that should say, of any variable is 2. So a quadratic function always has an something, some variable squared. That's a quadratic function. The graph of any quadratic function is a curve called a parabola. Parabolas come in two flavors. We have ones that open up like this, and we have ones that open down like this. Um, a parabola, it's a smooth curve. It's, we sometimes refer to it as a U shape because it, you know, kind of looks like the letter U. And something about all parabolas is that there is a maximum point or a minimum point, and that point is called the vertex. If the parabola opens up, like here, then this would have a minimum. So, excuse me, there we go. This would be the minimum of this graph. And of course, what does a minimum mean? That that is the smallest y value we'll see for that function. If the parabola opens down, then the vertex is a maximum. So here we would see this, this would be a maximum, and that just means that that particular y value, that output, is a bigger output value than any other output value on the graph. The graph is symmetric about a line, it's a vertical line, that passes through the vertex. We call this line the axis of symmetry, and since it's a vertical line, the axis of symmetry is always of the form x equals h. So sometimes when we're talking about the vertex of a parabola, or uh, we refer to it, its coordinates as h comma k, so the axis of symmetry would be x equals whatever that h value is, the x coordinate of the vertex. And so you can see when we draw the axis of symmetry, we usually use a dashed line because it's not actually part of the, the graph. It's just showing that there is a symmetry about it. Because it's symmetric about a vertical line, what that means is that points that are two units to the right of h and uh, points that are two units to the left of h will have the same output value. That's what that tells us. There are three common forms that we will write quadratic equations in, and we're going to talk about the pros of each one. Um, unfortunately, uh, me and textbooks don't aren't always in agreement here. Um, what I refer to at, for some of these is not the same as textbooks, so I do say both. Unfortunately, it's the same word for two different kinds, so you need to be really, really careful about which language your textbook uses. Um, so one way is standard form, but some books call this general form, and standard form for a quadratic equation is f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. This is just saying that the leading coefficient, the coefficient of x squared, can't be zero, because if it's zero, this term wouldn't exist, and then what would we be left with? bx plus c, that's a linear equation. So to make it quadratic, we have to have a, co a non-zero coefficient of x squared. Then there's vertex form, which some books refer to as standard form, so you see the standard and standard, great. Talk about a double standard, just kidding. Okay. Moving on from my awesome joke, in vertex form we have f of x equals a times x minus h squared plus k, and again, this isn't part of the equation, but we just have to have the disclaimer that a can't be zero, um, because again, if we get rid of that, then we're not going to have a quadratic, it would be a linear. And then there's factored form, that would be of the form f of x equals a times x minus c sub 1 times x minus c sub 2, and again, a can't be zero. Let's talk about each form and why we like them. So standard form or general form, what information does it tell us? Well, the coefficient, so remember what this is, this was f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. The coefficient of the first term, which would be a, tells us two things about the graph. It tells us whether it opens up or down. 
How does it tell us that? The sign. So if A is positive, which we say A is greater than zero, then the graph opens up, which I'm just gonna say up. And that just means that the graph will look like this. If A is negative, then the graph will open down. And it would open down like that. And the way you can always remember this is that if it's positive, it's smiley and happy. So it's opening up like a smiley face. And if it's negative, hmm, it's a frowny face. Wah, wah. Okay, A also tells us something else. So A is pretty important here. Um, it tells us whether the graph has a stretch or a shrink. And we don't care about the sign here. So when we don't care about the sign, then we, we just say we want the absolute value of it because we're just talking about the positive. So I'm going to say if the absolute value of A is greater than 1, then there is a stretch, a vertical stretch. We would call this a vertical stretch. And what that means, if there's a vertical stretch, is that if this is the parent function, this would be woo, closer to the y-axis. It gets pulled up. And if it's in between 0 and 1, then we would say there is a vertical shrink. And what that means is that it actually gets wider and further away from the uh, y-axis. So it would be a little bit like that if, if this is this one and this one are the parent functions. Nope, just kidding. If this one is the parent function and this one's the parent function, the stretch would pull it up and the shrink would make it wider. And the last thing that standard form tells us is it tells us very quickly the y-intercept. Because remember what the y-intercept is? It's when you plug in 0 for x. So this would cancel, this would cancel, we'd be left with C. So the y-intercept would be 0 comma C. So we always have that point on the graph, which is nice about standard form. And we can use standard form to determine the coordinates of the vertex. Um, without going into too much detail about where this comes from, but it secretly, newsflash, uh, what is that? Um, spoiler alert, there we go. It comes from the quadratic formula. Um, the coordinates of the vertex, if it's in standard form or general form, the x-coordinate of the vertex is negative b over 2a. So that would tell us the x-coordinate. Once you plug that in, uh, if you, when you plug in the value for b and the value for a, then you can figure out the y-coordinate of the vertex. So we say the vertex is of the form x comma, sorry, let's try that again. It's of the form negative b over 2a comma f of negative b over 2a. So that looks pretty scary and it is a little bit uh, of work, but it can be done. Okay, so that's it for standard form slash general form. What about standard form slash vertex form? So remember what this one is. This is f of x is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. This is the same a as from standard slash general form. So it tells us, the a tells us the same two pieces of information. It tells us whether the graph opens up or down. How do we know whether it opens up or down? This is like a little pop quiz. If a is positive, then the graph opens up. Remember, because it's smiling and happy? If A is negative, then the graph is opening down. It's frowny and sad. It also tells us if the graph has a stretch or a shrink. Remember how we tell that? If the absolute value of A is greater than 1, then we say that there's a stretch. It's being pulled up. And if the absolute value of A is in between 0 and 1, then we would say that there is a shrink. It's flattening. It's getting wider and wider. I like vertex form because it very quickly tells us what the vertex is. We don't have to do any calculations. It's given to us in the formula. Um, and what is the vertex? The vertex will be defined by h comma k. So as long as we have values for h and k and a in there, we know instantly the vertex. We know whether the graph is opening up or down. We know whether the graph has a stretch or a shrink. The last form is factored form. Um, remember what factored form was? So this was f of x is equal to a times x minus c sub 1 times x minus c sub 2. Um, it quickly tells us the x-intercepts of the graph. So generally speaking, we don't really, we're not ever really given quadratic equations in function form, but we use, uh, sorry, factored form, but we use factored form um, because it helps us find the x-intercepts. So the x-intercepts would be right here. You would set this equal to 0, and you would set this equal to 0. Because remember what an x-intercept is? It's when you uh, set f of x equal to 0. So it would be 0 equals a times factor times factor. a is a constant. a can't be 0. Remember, we already talked about that. So you set the factors that contain an x equal to 0. So we would have two x-intercepts. We would have that first constant, comma, 0, and we would have that second constant, comma, 0. Those would be our x-intercepts. 
Oh, and that was it. That's all factored form tells us. So again, we don't really use factored form all that much, but we do factor the quadratics into factored form if we're asked to find the x-intercepts. So now to go from standard form into vertex form. And again, we like vertex form because it tells us what the vertex is and it tells us a lot about the graph pretty upfront. If we are given a quadratic equation in standard form, there's a strategy we can use to rewrite it in vertex form using completing the square. And if you don't remember how to complete the square, now's a good time to pause this video and watch the video on completing the square, then come back to me. One important, uh, important piece of background information that we need is, um, so there's the idea of the addition property of equality that says, if I add four to the left-hand side, then I add it to the right-hand side too, and that way I'm not changing the, the value of the equation, right? It's, it's maintaining the same amount because I added the same amount to both sides. Well, what I do instead of adding the same amount to both sides is I add an amount and then I immediately subtract that amount. So for example, if I start out with Q and I add four to Q, without doing anything to the other side, I don't even have a second side of this equation, but to get back to Q, what would I have to do? I would have to subtract four. So my strategy is to add some value and then subtract that value from the same side of the equation because that's gonna cancel each other out anyway. Um, I know some people do add it to both sides and then subtract it later, but I say, wait, if we can save a step, let's save a step. Okay, so that's what I do. Now, what do we do? How do we deal with this? So remember, we're in standard form, right? Remember what standard form is. f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And what did I say we were going to do? I said we were going to complete the square. So in order to complete the square, I need two-thirds of a perfect square trinomial, right? Where is that two-thirds? Well, we'll get to that in just a minute. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, factor out the a from x squared and bx, okay? So we're going to ignore c. We're going to move c off to the side. I'm going to factor out a from x squared, which will, well, from ax squared, which will leave me with x squared. And when I factor it out of bx, that's going to leave me with b over a times x. I'm going to leave a gap there. And I'm not factoring it out from c, so it's going to just remain plus c, right? It's behind the parentheses, not part of this factoring thing. And there it is. There's two-thirds of a perfect square trinomial, x squared plus b over ax. So what would I do next? I need to fill in the third third. Remember how we do that? We take this b over a, we divide it by two, and when we divide it by two, this is telling us the second root, right? So the perfect square trinomial factors into root minus root or root plus root. This is that second root. Um, and then to fill in the third piece, we would need to square that root. That's what the, the perfect square trinomial has the first term squared and the last term squared. This is the square of the second root. So this, what we would be doing is adding b squared over 4a squared to, uh, to the inside the parentheses. But then the question is, what did we actually just add? And here's where this, as if this wasn't difficult enough, here's where this can get a little bit complicated. I didn't just necessarily add b squared over 4a squared to, to this side of the um, quadratic function. What did I add then? Well, remember, this a gets distributed over here. It's inside the parentheses where a gets distributed. So what I really added was b squared over 4a. I really added b squared over 4a, which means if I added b squared over 4a to this side, I need to undo that as well. So I say minus b squared over 4a. And that way, that's showing us what we actually added. I know that's really weird and complicated and showing it with um, variables can make it even worse, but I promise when, well, it's, it's still pretty complicated. So you just have to give yourself time and be patient but eventually it will click like, oh, okay, because I distribute the A, so that's why that wasn't really what I added to this side. Okay, so where does this leave us? We have F of X is equal to A. Now I can factor this thing, because now it's a perfect square trinomial. It's root plus root squared plus, and then if I put C, I mean, this gets a little bit funky, but, and again, these are going to be numbers, so it's going to be a lot nicer than this. So this is my K right here, this awkward looking thing, and here's my negative H. So that would be going from standard form to vertex form. We're gonna look at one example, and it, we're not gonna have to worry about that factoring out the A because X squared already has a coefficient of one. There's another video after this one where we will look at some examples of that, so check that video out if you wanna see more information about that. Okay, so here we have it. It's in standard form. We wanna put it in vertex form. I don't have to worry about factoring anything out, yay, yet. Don't have to worry about that yet. So what we do, is we're going to say x squared minus 10x, leave a big gap, 
and put plus 13. And now what we're going to do is we need to figure out, okay, if x squared minus 10x is 2 thirds of a perfect square trinomial, what's the third third? So we take the negative 10 and we divide it in half, and that right there is the root. Then we square it to fill in the third third, and we would add 25 because negative 5 quantity squared is positive 25. Now I just added 25. How can I immediately undo that? By subtracting 25. So I'm going to come right here and subtract 25. Notice I'm still on the same side of the equation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to just consider this because that's a perfect square trinomial. That's why we added 25 in the first place. This will factor into root minus root. It's a minus because it's a minus 10x. This was a minus 5 when we divided. Squared minus 12 because 13 minus 25 is negative 12. And there it is. This is vertex form. This tells us A is 1, so there's no stretch or shrink. It's positive, so it's opening up. And we also know that the vertex is 5, comma, negative 12. Notice that when I write the vertex, remember it's x minus h. So h has the opposite sign of what we see in the parentheses. The k plus k, it's the same sign. So it's positive 5, and my, it looks like 72, so I'm going to rewrite it. And that's a negative 12. That's the vertex of this particular quadratic function. Thank you for stopping by.